Welcome everybody, my name is Chad, of course, this is my channel, The Famous Background. With me, in honor, by the way, is Steve Kaufman. Uh, for anyone that is unfamiliar, Steve, it is a pleasure to meet you, by the way. Uh, if my you could just pleasure. explain to anyone that might not know you very well, like, who, who the heck are you? Why am I so excited to know you? Uh, who the heck am I? Well, I'm a 74-year-old grandpa who lives in Vancouver, British Columbia. Locked down now, like everyone else is. And uh, for most of my career, I was in the lumber business. But uh, along the way, you know, I was a diplomat for seven years and uh, learned Mandarin Chinese, lived in Japan for nine years, both uh, in the, working for the embassy and working uh, in the forest industry. And then for most of my career, I was in the forest industry. But in the last uh, dozen years or so, I've gotten very interested in language learning. And I've, I've learned more languages since the age of 60 than I did prior to that. And together with my son, we've set up a language learning uh, community called Link, and I have a YouTube channel, and uh, that's what I uh, spend my retirement years doing. Man, I'm jealous. I, I when I was talking to Eric, who I think is your assistant, um, yep. he was letting me know a little bit about your journey in Japanese. That tends to be, if you can't tell by the background, that tends to be my focus online. Okay, very uh, good. But the thing that really stuck out to me was. Like, well, first off, when did you go to Japan? When did you live in Japan? Okay, so I went to Japan basically in January of 1971. And uh, I had, uh, prior to that, I'd been in Hong Kong for two and a half years. And the first year of that was spent learning Mandarin Chinese. And thereafter, I worked as a Canadian government trade commissioner going in and out of China in the, the late 60s, early 70s. Uh, so when I arrived in Japan, I, I could read kanji. Yeah. Okay. You had a leg up a little bit. <laughs> the big leg up. Two big legs leg up. up. So the thing that kind of sparked an interest in why I wanted to interview you right, was you learned Japanese before all of this golden era of info. Right? You didn't have the apps. You didn't have the textbooks. You didn't have any of that stuff. And that's right. kind of my shtick. I, it, I review textbooks and Japanese resources. That's what my channel's about. So okay. I kind of wanted to talk to you because you are the resource. You did something before we had any of this, and I kind right. of wanted to know how. Like, I... Oh, oh sorry, go yes. ahead. No, so, well, what happened was, first of all, when I was in Hong Kong learning Mandarin, and bear in mind that Hong Kong was not then a Mandarin-speaking place. So, all the material that I found would be, you know, uh, audio, and remember, that was the era of the open reel tape recorder, right? You didn't carry around an MP3 player. You had this thing that never left my house. It was like this big, right? And uh, But I didn't have very much stuff to listen to. Certainly, I couldn't go to the internet and find uh, YouTube videos. Um, so, But fortunately for Chinese, there was a lot of material developed by Yale, the Yale and China series. A lot of graded material on Chinese history, blah, blah, blah. When I came to Japan, there wasn't as much. Uh, when I came to Japan, my first task was to learn the, the kana, hiragana, katakana. So there was a series there called Naganuma. I'm sure it doesn't exist anymore, but it was all written in hiragana. So I would spend my first little while reading Naganuma to get used to the hiragana. And, uh, and eventually I found textbooks. I went to the bookstores. Uh, and typically in those days, you'd be looking for readers that had a, a sort of a glossary behind each chapter. Because looking a word up in a Japanese, traditional Japanese dictionary or Chinese dictionary is tremendously time consuming. And no sooner have you closed the dictionary that you've, you've forgotten what, was, what the meaning was. Like that's how it is in life. And so you look for uh, readers that have a little glossary behind each chapter. Which is not ideal because very often words that you don't know aren't in the glossary. Or half the glossary consists of words that you already know. So... But it's, it's better than nothing. So I would find any book I would, could find, I would just read it. And so the strategy was just listening and reading. That so was it. You, yeah? Oh, no, go ahead. No, I was going to say one sort of real uh, tremendous source of listening material was a, 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 um, um, basically a collection of, of cassette tapes. You know, that was the era of the cassette tapes that eventually get all tied up into a spaghetti knot that you can't use them anymore. But that's what we had, and uh, it was called Showa no Kiroku. And it was a sort of a history of the Showa era, including the actual voices of the people. 
And I must have listened to that, I don't know how many times, even when I didn't understand it all, it was just kind of drilling it into my brain. Never went to school for Japanese, just learned it. So, I mean, you said that your strategy was read as much as you can, listen as much as you can, right? Yep. Trying to find those show up books and stuff. Um, I mean, what, to my mind, right? Like, I to get to the level that I've gotten to, which really isn't even that impressive in the scale of things, and I have all the luxuries in the world to get there, was such yeah. a pain to get to that level. It was it was just, I mean, I love it, but it was years of torture. It's like working out. Right. Like, it's yeah. it hurts your muscles, but after a long time, you, you learn to love the, the soreness. Right. I mean, I can only imagine what it would be like to have to just go through a physical dictionary and, and going to listen to, listening to tapes over and over and over, even if you don't understand it. So I guess my question is, uh, I'll split it up. You're listening to stuff even if you don't understand it. Can you tell me why? Okay, first of all, uh, you know, listening, you can listen for different reasons. So, you know, you can listen to stuff where you're motivated, like, for example, like right now I'm learning Arabic and Persian, so uh, on our system at Link we have these mini stories, which I have listened to 20 or 30 times. So there I'm listening to get a better... To, to, to become more familiar with how the language works, to get more words and stuff, but it's not captivating content. When I listened to the show on Okiroku, the experience was, it, it's just that these were the actual voices of 1940, 1936, 1952, MacArthur, whatever it might be, you know, you have this feeling that you're participating in, in that era and you're hearing these people speak. And it's not that I didn't understand anything. I un understood 30, 40, 50%, sometimes more. Sometimes I'd understand for a while and then I would lose it. So the, the enjoyment was that sense of being transported back 30 or 40 years. Uh, the sense that you understood a little more and a little more each time. You're listening to genuine, authentic content, historical content, all of those things. And, and there is a music to the language. And, uh, and all of that helps you get into the language. But, but obviously, in order to learn more words, I had to read material where I had a chance of looking the words up, which nowadays you can do with online dictionaries. In those days, I did with readers that had the glossary behind each chapter. And of course, you forget, you re relearn, you re-forget, you relearn. I mean, that's that whole process. Uh, but also I was surrounded by Japanese. I needed it for my work. Um, so I, I was just motivated. Yeah. I mean, it, especially right now, it, I can only speak for the Japanese community. Obviously I don't know the Arabic or Persian YouTube communities mm -hmm. or anything like that. Uh, starting in like the early 2010s or so, there was this really toxic kind of movement that came through that was almost like trying to speed run the language. It right. wasn't about being passionate or loving it. It was like, how fast could I reach X or Y? And right. even I fell into that. I'd never learned a language before, so I thought that that was the mindset. I thought that's how the people who go far in the language think. And why I'm so interested in you is that you have that same, like, I just love the process of learning, and right. I consume a lot. I have this huge input, but it's not because I have to. I'm trying to get eight or 10 hours of whatever in, it's like, hey, if I'm super engaged and I want to hear the voices of the of the 1940s for an hour or two, it's just because you love it and that made you connect to it so much more than if you were just trying to, to cram as much as you could. And that's actually why I'm so excited to talk to you because that's the method that I like. Yeah, I mean, and even when I was learning Chinese where I, I was under a bit of pressure, I was being paid by the Canadian government to learn Chinese. So, uh, you know, it's not like learning it for fun. I had to learn it. But I was discovering the whole world of China, 1911, they come out from under the Qing dynasty and then the warlords and the Japanese invasion. And you're, you're learning about the history of the country via the language. So it's, it's all very fascinating. But I was putting in like, that was my job, right? They were paying me. So I was putting in six, seven hours a day in Chinese. With Japanese, it was more, I'm surrounded by the language. I speak to people when I can. If I'm in the car, I put this thing on. I wouldn't go home and just crash and, you know, like totally focus on Japanese the way I did with the Chinese. But I still did a fair amount of deliberate reading. Reading is very, very powerful. Now, it's much easier today because, you know, you got Netflix, you got YouTube, you got so many different things, so many tools. 
Uh, but the basic principle is the same, listening and reading and trying to find ways to enjoy it and certainly not feeling any pressure when I was learning Japanese, no pressure. No pressure. Yeah, that pressure is so abundant right now. Well, it's getting mm -hmm. better. It was very abundant for a while where people were like, if you don't do you know, eight or 10 hours a day, if you're not doing this, you might as well not even study the language. And that yeah. was, I mean, to be honest, you don't know much about my channel. I'm sure I'm just some blip in your screen, but well, I had to look through it. I had to look through it. Well, for you sure. know, but yeah, there, yeah. there's a, a rule that I've had, which is I don't speak Japanese on my personal channel uh, right. for that reason, because it's always been the, the space always had this kind of peeing contest about, Oh, am I better than this guy? Or is he yeah, better? Who should that's... I listen to? And it's just, man, exactly. And can I say, I watched a video you did, um, yeah. yeah, I don't even know how long ago it was, but it, it helped me so much. It was your declaration of independence in Japanese video that you made. Oh yes. Yeah. And hearing that and going, I'm studying for me, I'm setting goals that I want to hit. I don't care what other people have to Absolutely. say. Absolutely. My gosh, man. It's, and by the way, if you guys haven't seen it, I'll link that video personally down below. Watch okay. it. It just make that your mantra because that changed how I saw like, I'm getting excited like, talking you, about it. Man, I love yeah, it. Yeah, you have no right. Like, I, ha I had a discussion with, uh, I think it's Matt, who's a very keen uh, Japanese learner and who speaks Japanese very, very well, and whose accent in Japanese pronunciation is absolutely excellent. Good for him. Not everyone has to aspire to that or do that. Uh, you know, we have the right to not understand what is said, and still enjoy it. Like I listened to my show on Okiroku and I understood half of it. That's my right. Or I misunderstood it. It's still, it's still bombarding my brain with the language. Similarly, when we speak, I don't want to compete with anyone in my pronunciation. Uh, personally, I've never been interested in pitch accent. I really don't know what it is. And I communicate like I did business. I lived in Japan for nine years. Uh, within a year or so, I was doing business with people you know, going drinking with them in the evening, business people, I never had a problem. And, uh, well, you know, that's because the Japanese won't tell you if your Japanese sucks or something. No, they're happy communicating. They're not there to judge. I don't think it's my right to judge anyone else. I would certainly not volunteer any comments. But you do see this, you know, oh, you know, his Japanese is no good or something. Don't worry about your own. Don't don't uh, comment on or criticize other people. They all learn for their own reasons and uh, that's good enough. Yeah, I mean, I've been working at a tattoo shop in Japan for years. I've been a uh, speech, I don't know what you call it, critiquer at the Japanese consulate here in America. Right. Clearly, you don't get employed with that stuff if you can't speak anything. And yet, people right. just get mad if you mess up uh, an R sound or Maybe you said yeah. something a little kind of foreign-y instead of, oh, well, the natives would say it this way. And I know that stops so many people, but that's why I want people to know you and to get to hear your story and how it's like, dang, man, just love the process and study it for the reasons you want to study it. Like, if you just I want mean, to listen to anime, cool, yeah, that's, that's your fine. exposure. That's fine. That's fine. Um, you know, it's several things. First of all, I have done business in, in many countries, in many languages. Sometimes in, we speak in their language. Sometimes we speak in English. And any number of non-native speakers of English make mistakes. It has never bothered me. It doesn't bother me. We do business. As long as I understand what they're saying and they understand what I'm saying, we're happy. Amen, amen. Uh, you know, period. And um, so I, I think there's this obsession of, uh, you know, trying to, you know, and then you get these people who say, well, you know, you say you speak language X, but uh, if you can't say... Uh, tie my shoelaces in the language, then you don't really speak the language. Well, if I have never had to say tie my shoelaces, because it has, it has never come up in a conversation, uh, in any conversation in, the, in that language, I won't know how to say it. And if I need to find out how to say it, someone will tell me and then I'll know how to say it. Or so, you know, you have the tools to look up how to say it. It's not yeah, that you, you're choosing not to know it, it just it hasn't come up. Like when you were saying that, I was like, do I know how to say it? Tie my shoes in Japanese. I, I know how to say how to take say them it. off. I've, I've, I've discussed philosophy in Japanese with one of our customers. I had to go there once a month. We sold them newsprint, a newspaper publisher in, in Nagoya, Chunichi Shimbun. I had to drink a bottle of whiskey with him once a month just so he would continue buying our paper. Uh, but I don't know how to say tie my shoelaces. Maybe himo, I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't know. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's, it's absolutely. We learn for our own reasons. 
And if the more we enjoy it, the better we do. So why do things? Why introduce negativity? Exactly. That's my whole channel is about the positive experience. It's learning it because you love it. Do what you love. Do more of what you love and less of what you don't love. And eventually right. those spheres, like for me, I'm interested in Japanese tattoos. I have, you know, big ones. I'm interested okay. in fishing. I love Japanese uh, miyakusuri fishing, right? It's kind of like fly okay. fishing. So I could speak tables around someone who's only ever done eight hours a day of cramming in fishing because they're not watching fishing shows, but I am. Right. But if they yeah. try and say, hey, Chad, how do you say tie your shoes? I don't know. It's not my sphere. I, I haven't read a book that that came up. I haven't encountered that in a conversation. So right. for, for people like, hopefully like us, that just love this stuff and want to keep studying it, I know you have your own website and your own sources. And by the way, just thank you so much for your time. This was... No, this no, is a real I, honor for me. Love it, love it, love it. Uh, would you just tell people like how they can get connected to you and find you and, and maybe make sure. this place a little brighter? So uh, I just want to say one more thing about motivation. Like everyone says motivation is the key. The brain, when our performance exceeds our expectations, when things are better than we expected, the brain gets a kick of dopamine. Really? Okay. Yes. So there, And therefore you're motivated to continue doing it because it turned out better than you expected. So that whenever we criticize people or imply that they're not good, we're basically knocking them down. And so bear that in mind, okay? And so far as, yeah, I have a, a YouTube channel called Lingo Steve. Uh, we have a website for language learning called link, L-I-N-G-Q dot com, uh, community of people uh, learning. And uh, so you can meet me at my uh, YouTube channel or you can come and join us at link. And um, yeah, language learners of the world unite. Exactly. And you guys should definitely go support Steve. He's doing a lot of cool stuff in the space. Thank you so, okay. so much for Thank hanging you, out Chad. with me. I appreciate it. Uh, everybody, as I always say, love hard, love deep, and I will see you all next week. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.